quick review from yesterday. Does anybody know? We're going to go from west to east. Remember, east is up at the top. Does anybody remember the first region? Coastal, Coastal plain, right? Next one. Wilderness. Nope. Tom, oh yeah, I was going to tell Tom be quiet. <laughs> Shefela, foothills, right? Next? Mountains. mountains, there you go. That's an easy one. Then after the mountains, before the Rift Valley, I, oh, I should have shut my mouth. There you go. Next one is? Wilderness. Wilderness. Then? The Rift Valley. So it's not the Jordan, Jordan Valley. Remember the Jordan Valley? Jordan, the River Jordan ends at the Dead Sea, but the valley keeps, continues. And then the term that I use is Transjordan. Trans There's a lot of different ways, whatever you want to describe it. So we got Transjordan, Rift Valley, Judea Wilderness, Mountains, Shefela, and Coastal Plain. So please read after me. Please repeat after me. Coastal Plain. Shefela. Mountains, Mountains, wilderness, wilderness. Rift Valley, Rift Valley. Transjordan. Transjordan, back, Transjordan, Rift Valley, wilderness, mountains, Shefela, coastal plain. Got it? Good. Let's see, do I need to do, oh yeah, 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 we'll go through that real quick. Oh, I had it set up already. She was, I forgot I'd done that to the PowerPoint. What we're doing here? Okay, we'll do that in a little bit. Now, this morning at church in our service, uh, there was a region. We started this. I hope everybody got your maps. Does everybody have your maps going from south to north? Everybody? Anybody need one? Some we got some out there. Tom will get you one. You want to make sure you fill in your box called Negev. Remember, Negev is a Hebrew word meaning dry. And we took a look at some of those pictures. We got more maps to give you a little bit later on too. <laughs> so I did one lesson for you in the Negev. There are many others I could do from a biblical point of view, but what I want to do is I want to concentrate on the central area. Now you already know the central area. The central area you would say is mountains. No, it's not. Remember, the central area right in here is going to be coastal plain, Shefela, mountains, Judean wilderness, Rift Valley, Transjordan. That's the central area, okay? So I'm just doing central area, and that encompasses all that stuff, but there is something I want you to see about the central area. Again, the central area is mountains like this. By the way, all those trees there, those were planted by people since 1948. All the trees in Israel have been planted by people. My wife and I donate to that almost every year. So all my grandkids, they always get a, some sort of a plaque that says, ah, an olive tree was planted for you in Israel at a certain garden in May. Adonai bless you. And it's a Jewish place, you know. Uh, I don't know if there's any Christian places that do that. But all these trees were planted because Israel was just devastated in terms of, from a geological point of view. Um, but all of this is, uh, there are a lot of pine trees there. It almost looks like northern Minnesota, for goodness sake. Um, and again, here's uh, a part of the Shefela and part of the central region again. And here is what you're at. You're actually looking at Mount, this, uh, you're at Mount Ebal, looking at another mountain across the way called Mount Gerizim. And you'll remember, God said to Joshua, you're going to go to these two mountains. One group will be on Mount Ebal. The other one will be on Mount Gerizim. One will say the blessings and the other will say the curses. Remember that? Okay, so that happens right here. So in the central area, what I want to show you is, this is based upon some serious historical work. How did Abraham travel to the central area? You'll see that. Well, they know based upon historical evidence from many cultures, the roads that existed in Abraham's day, the trade routes. 
That is all over. Egyptians have it not documented uh, in hieroglyphics in their temples. The Assyrians have it and so on. So they said it's likely if Abraham is at Haran, and he's going to leave Syria, which was called Aram in those days. He would travel this way down to Damascus, skirting the mountains. Here's the mountains of Lebanon. From there, stay outside of the mountains, cross the Jordan River, and go to Shechem, and from Shechem down to Gaza. They said that's the likely path that he would have taken, because there was a trade route there. So in terms of the path of the patriarchs, so he would be at Damascus. From Damascus, he would come here on the Golan Heights. You heard about the Golan Heights? It's as flat as South Dakota. The difference between the Golan Heights and South Dakota is there's volcanoes there. Seriously, that are extinct, okay, but you can see the volcano cones. So there's a couple of volcanoes here. Some of this is Syria, some of this is Israel, okay, because the border of Israel and Syria is here. They came across the Golan Heights, went down one of the wadis, the Nahals, okay, and crossed here, went up Wadi Farah, from Wadi Farah up to Shechem, and then you know he goes down to Gaza and Beersheba. So again, that's the path of the patriarchs. And now we're really dealing with geography, right? Really dealing with geography. We're dealing with paths. We're dealing with mountains and locations. So he would have come down the uh, valley right up in here. Oh, I can't remember the name of the valley, but that's not important. He comes down to this now hall, and actually it's a stream. Oh, the Jabbok Canyon because of the Jabbok River. There actually is a river there. Okay, so it's not a Nahal, okay, because that's a dry riverbed. This is actually a river canyon, the Jabbok Canyon. So they would have come down the Jabbok Canyon. That's the road. Remember? We talked about the four valleys yesterday on the Shefela. We talked about the Ailan, the Ila, the Sorek, and the Lakish. Those were the Nachalim. And those were the valleys where you would go up to Jerusalem. They followed the roads. Same thing here. The Jabbok Canyon. Come down here, and there was a crossing at Adam and a ford. And then up the Farah Valley, up to Shechem. And notice at Shechem, you have Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. So at the city of Shechem, we've got those two mountains. So this is pretty important. So there's something about the city of Shechem. Wait till you see this. This is, this is amazing. And where's Kurt? Kurt, are you here? Okay. This lesson shows you again how the Bible is one book. There's no Old New Testament. There's no New Testament. And the Torah testifies of Jesus. Watch this. Here's Shechem. There's something about the city. There's something about the specific area. Okay? And we're disconnected from our Jewish roots. We're disconnected from our geography. So we have little understanding of this geography and the importance of this city. It escapes us. So we're going to study now. Uh, the patriarchs of those early days, and we're going to see how Shechem plays a role in the biblical narrative. The redemption plan, and here it is. What we're after is we want to see a picture from God, okay, as an example of his redemption plan. The redemption plan of Adonai El Elyon, okay, which is the Lord God Most High in Hebrew. So, we're taking a look again at the map, looking at Syria, area of Mesopotamia, Aram, and there is Haran, and we know Abraham comes down, Damascus, finally down to Shechem, and from Shechem he goes down and lives in the Beersheba area, just north of the Negev. So Abraham comes there, but... Now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land. He gives him a place which I will show you and I will make you a great nation. He's going to give him people. I mean, this is a, he doesn't even have a son yet. Okay. And his wife is old. She's beautiful, but she's old. I mean, remember Sarah saying, I'm old. I'm going to get a kid. Okay. So the thing is, is that you're, you're going to be a great, you can have all these people. And I will bless you and make your name great. He's going to have a great position in history. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in all, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So here's Abraham. He's given a place, a people, a position, and a purpose. And you know what the purpose is. 
That's Yeshua. That's Jesus. As a blessing to all the nations. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And he comes here. This is an artist rendering, an archaeological artist rendering of the city of Shechem in those days. Mount Ebal is over here. Mount Gerizim is here. You can see a trade route that comes up. The road comes up from this way. Probably uh, Abraham probably came from the north. So God calls Abraham, gives him a place, a great nation, a position. He's got a position among all the Jews, among all the Christians, and among all the Muslims. Think about that. That's a heck of a lot of people who believe in one God, right? We could say the Muslims have it wrong, okay? The Jews have it partially right. They miss Jesus, okay? But this is amazing. This is an amazing position of Abram, or Abraham, okay, to the three religions in the world that are monotheistic. Isn't that interesting? That is fascinating. Abraham is given a purpose. Through him, Sarah, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And we know that's the Messiah and Savior, our Jesus. And where does he stop when he enters the land? Shechem. So he comes there, right? <clears throat> Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, in Genesis 12, 5 through 7, in all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Canaan, actually, is pronounced Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Avram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem. Big city. Big trade city. Oh, man, you could read a lot about this if you go into archaeology. To the Oak of Moray. Now the Can Canaanite was then in, there in the land. The Lord appeared to Avram and said, To your descendants I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who would appear to him. So at Shechem he comes. This is it. And God said, Don't worry about these Canaanites. Don't worry about Shechem. Don't worry about, this is your land. <laughs> and it's like Abraham, yeah, right. What am I going to do? I got a knife. I got a wife who's old and lot with me. Okay. And some other people from Haran. We're going to take over the, it doesn't even have an army. Okay. God's promise at Shechem, one man. Yes. There it is. He's at Shechem. God's promise. He starts with one man. Right. This is a cool picture. Make believe this is Abraham. Make believe this is Sarah. And make believe that's their grandson. Jacob. Jacob was a teenager before Abraham died. Isn't that cool? He knew Grandpa. Grandpa was Abraham. His dad was Isaac, right? Isaac was the son of Abraham. Isaac had Jacob and, what's his name? Esau, right? And when you check the dating and you check the ages, it just so happens that Jacob was a teenager when Abraham died. So can you imagine Jacob sitting at Abraham's tent, eating lamb, good vegetables, having some really cold water out of the well. Grandpa, Grandpa, what's Haran like? What was that like? Oh, let me tell you, Jacob. I'll tell you all about it. How did you get there? You remember the Faria Valley? Yes, I remember that. You go down the Faria Valley, you cross at Adam, you go up the Jabak River, and then you hit the road. There's a road there. I know you've never been there, Jacob, but trust me, there's a road. It's called the, valley, the, the King's Highway. You take the King's Highway to Damascus. Oh, Damascus, stop there. Oh, my goodness, do they have good kosher food? <laughs> he trained his kid. He said, he, Jacob probably learned how to get there. The role of the patriarchs, just sitting there at his grandfather's tent. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on Esau's hill. Isaac was 60. Now look at this. All right. Isaac was 60 when he had Jacob and Esau. Abraham, okay, had Isaac when he was 100. These are all the years of Abraham's life, 175. Oh, how old was Jacob when his grandpa died? 15. There's your proof. He's a teenager. 
No, Jacob is born when Abraham was 160 years old. Jacob must have known his grandpa. Wow. Can you imagine the stories? Wow, can you imagine the stories sitting at Abraham's feet? Jacob, I met God. You're kidding. When did you meet God? Let me tell you a story. Wow. Sitting around the campfire with grandpa and, and his grandma Sarah. Jacob probably learned the way to Haran from his grandpa. We don't know that, okay? But it's interesting to note that he was alive before his grandpa died. There's grandpa, there's grandma, and there's Jacob. Wow, pretty cool. I bet Sarah was really proud. But maybe Sarah was dead already. Ooh, I didn't check that out. Okay. I have to check that out. I can't remember how old Abraham was when Sarah died. That's something I have to check out. So, Jacob obeys his mama, Rebecca. He deceived his father, Isaac. We know this whole story. He got the right of the firstborn. He gets the double portion. Esau found out about it, and Jacob had to escape. So he took his mom's advice, and he's going to take off. Mama said, get out of here. All right, go to Haran. Take the way of the patriarchs and go back to Haran. Go back to your uncle Laban. So with Laban and Haran, Jacob marries Leah. You remember the trick? He sees Rachel. Whoo. Whoa. She was gorgeous. That's what the Bible says. She was really a young lady who was um, formed well, okay? <laughs> but then Laban tricks him, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, Leah, you know, you start reading about the Hebrew name. The Hebrew name basically means weak eyes, okay? And it could very well be. She is a beautiful, she's older, okay, than Rachel, but she's probably just as beautiful, but weak eyes. Uh, and there could be a lot of things in there that God is saying about her, not that she's ugly, okay, but maybe something about her personality. Rachel was a fiery little girl, right? She, seriously, Rachel was a fire girl, all right? I don't know if she probably had a good temper. You should read about Leah and Rachel about the mandrakes. Remember that? I want those mandrakes, Leah said. They're mine. I'm going to talk to you. They're mine, mandrake. They were, mandrakes were an aphrodisiac in those days. So they were fighting over this because they wanted to make love with Jacob. That's, that's serious. That's exactly what, what they, were, they were used for. I don't know if they worked. I don't even know what a mandrake is. Some plant. So Laban deceived Jacob. What you sow, you will reap. Um, in other words, Jacob deceived his dad, and all of a sudden he's deceived. What goes around comes around. He's got to say, you deceive Papa, guess what's going to happen to you, you know? Then he marries Rachel. The Jacob and family return to Canaan. Jacob confronts Esau, so really trying to capitalize this, and the meeting was friendly. Jacob was expecting he was going to get killed, all right? When you take a read that story. And where does Jacob end up? Shake him. God's promise. One family. Look what's happened. Shechem, Abraham stops there. One man. He's got the four promises of position, place, people, and purpose, right? It's now passed on to Jacob. Jacob comes to Shechem, and now it's a family. Jacob with his two wives and the boys. And the girl, Dinah. Okay, they had one girl in there. So now you got a family. Hey, the promise is beginning to grow, yes? So let's continue. Supposedly, okay, just like his grandfather Jacob, uh, just like his grandfather Jacob goes to Shechem, just like his grandfather, he builds an altar. It says that in the Bible. When you read the story, he builds an altar just like his, his grandpa. Abraham comes to Shechem. He's one man walking in the promises of Adonai. Jacob arrives next with the foundation of the nation. He's got the 13, he's got the 12 boys. Then we know Joseph later on, the story of Joseph. He has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So technically speaking, you have 13 tribes, right? Uh, they call it 12, 12, the, they're called half tribes. 
But again, Jacob arrives with the foundation of the nation. We see the covenant of God made with Abraham beginning to become a reality right there at the city of Shechem. Jacob begins to own the land. Do you remember that? He bought some land at Shechem. And supposedly, he buys the place when you and supposedly the tradition says he dug a well. Now, where they the, the Bible does not say he dug a well. It's not there. That's Jewish tradition. Because they say, okay, you're going to buy the land, and you have flocks and herds. What do you need? Water. So what are you going to do? Dig a well. Jacob dug a well. Well, <laughs> all right. We don't know that. That's important. Very important. So hang on to that, okay? You're looking at the possibility of what Jacob's well is. This, you can visit this place today. This is a Palestinian site. It's near the city of Nablus, which is the ancient city of Shechem. And the Palestinians would tell you, we think this is Jacob's well. The Bible doesn't say that. Remember tradition, okay? But hang on to that. Here it is. There's Nablus. Shechem is right in kind of in front of us, the ruins of the city. Gerizim is here on the left, and Ebal is over there on the right. And here comes Joshua. What does he do when he comes into the land? You can read the whole story after Jericho. And here it is, Joshua 8, 28 to 35. So Joshua burned the city of Ai. This happens after Jericho. First they attacked Jericho, the walls came tumbling down, right? The next is Ai. That's a sad story, but it's, a, uh, it's an interesting story. After that, we read this. Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation until this day. He hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening, and at sunset, Joshua gave command. They took his body down from the tree and threw it in the entrance of the city gate and raised over it a great heap of stones that stands to this day. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. Where's Mount Ebal? Shechem. Abraham's first. Jacob's second. Who's third? Joshua. Look at this. At, at, Mount, at Shechem, Mount Ebal. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the sons of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law, the, the, the book of Torah, an altar of uncut stones of which no man had wielded an iron tool, and they offered burnt sacrifices. So I will continue to go on. Half of them stood in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses of the uh, Lord had commanded them, and he read all the works of the Torah and the blessings and the curses. All right? That's the story. He said, she came. You're looking at the ruins of the city of Shechem. I can't remember what this pillar is. Oh, it's a pillar in one of the um, altars. Not uh, altars, one of the... Um, matter of fact, here it is. That's a Masaba standing stone in front of the fortress temple at Shechem. This could be the stone. This may be the stone Joshua erected at Shechem. We don't know, but it could be. He erected a pillar, okay, at Shechem. So again, you read that. Could it be that pillar? It could be. We don't know. Here you're looking at the entrance into the temple of their god, the Canaanite god. I can't remember what god it was at that time, but you're seeing right in here the main gate into the temple and the stairways into it. Okay, That's dated prior to Abraham's day. So that means Abraham, Jacob, and it could very well be Joshua, actually were there. <laughs> to walk in places, again, where these guys walked. Gates are dated to the 16th century B.C., prior. Oh no, excuse me, these are gates dated to the 16th uh, century B.C. This is not uh, Abraham. And definitely not Jacob, but maybe Joshua. Abraham comes here as one man. Jacob, he's next to arrive with his wives, Rachel, and Leah and the kids. God is blessing Abraham and his descendants. You see it, a people in a place. Now, because Jacob bought the land. It's the first piece of land the Hebrews owned. That's it. Okay. Why is it mentioned? 
because we have legal precedents for the Hebrews to take over the land. They started buying it. Remember what David purchased in Jerusalem? He bought a piece of land on top of the mountain. He bought a place where they did the wheat stuff. Remember what they call that? What do they call that? A threshing floor. Okay. Onan, Ornan, or something like that. I forget his name. He bought that. He owned it. What did Abraham buy? Actually, it's uh, Jacob didn't, wasn't the first one. What did Abraham buy? He's the first one. He bought the cave of Machpelah for his wife and him so he could be buried. So they started buying things. The Hebrews are actually buying things from the Canaanites. So Joshua, he's next. He comes here with millions. Well, we think millions. Could have been thousands. The promises of God are appearing before our eyes. Abraham has people and a place. Joshua builds an altar on Mount Ebal to sacrifice to Elohe Israel, the God of Israel. By the way, you see that little piece up there in blue? They found this. It's an Israeli altar. Hebrew altar on the top of Mount Ebal. They discovered that probably about 50 years ago. It's exactly like the altars the ancient Hebrews would have built with uncut stones, exactly as you read in the story of Joshua. Could it be, or was it later? We don't know. This could actually be the altar to Joshua. There it is. That's it. You can visit it today. It's not much to see, but it could very well be that that is the altar that Joshua actually built to sacrifice there at Mount Ebal. And is it possible that if it is Joshua's, that Abraham's and Jacob's would be underneath? Or maybe in the same location. We don't know. Again, so here is Mount Gerizim. We're on Mount Ebal, and here is uh, that altar, the Hebrew altar. Okay, discovered 1980 A.D. Fascinating. Fascinating that they found that. Another look at Shechem, but there it is, looking at a different artist's rendering, a 3D view of it. God's promise, one nation. Look at this. Shechem, one man. Next, one family. Next, Israel, the nation. Pretty cool, if you understand geography. I'm not done. This map, and I'm just going to do this right here. You may want to take the notes down. There is a website. The website is bback.com. I'll spell it for you. B I B. Back. B A C K. Biblical backgrounds is what it stands for. It's a ministry. B I B B A C K. Okay, B back. Huh? I think it's in the bulletin. It's probably in the bulletin. These, this place, um, Dr. Stephen Lancaster uh, and the other guy, I forget his name, Moen. These guys have developed the best Bible maps on the face of the earth. If you wanted to buy one single map, they're about a buck and a half each. If you want to buy them all, um, I can't think there's nine of them. Um, I can't remember what the price is. Maybe it's 10 bucks or 12 bucks. These are the best maps. This is actually a scan. I have permission from Dr. Lancaster that I can scan these. I cannot make a copy of this. So this is copyrighted. So he said, no, that's fine. You can use it in your PowerPoint, John. And then I'll tell you about it. So you can go to that website. And if you want the best maps, Biblical maps, New and Old Testament as one, that's where you go. For instance, when I scan this, what he has in here, here's Shechem. Here's Mount Gerizim, here's Mount Ebal, and notice it's a 3D map. It's showing you the actual, these are the actual ridges. This is amazing. This is not just a drawing. You know, they've actually done this. So when you're on Mount Ebal and you wanted to walk down this canyon, that canyon exists. This, so this is quite amazing. Now, they give you the height and the elevations of each of these mountains, but in the New Testament time, there was a town here called Sikar. Shechem 
basically is gone by the time the New Testament appears. But in the New Testament, there was a village there called Sikar. Okay? You with me? So Sikar and Shechem. But notice, the New Testament uh, cities are in italics. The Old Testament city are in straight print. So that's why. And look at this. Here's the city of Samaria. Ahab and Jezebel had a palace here. And then in Jesus' day, it was a Roman city called Sebaste. So you can see that in the italics, that's the, that would be the New Testament city. Shechem's Old Testament city, it declined in importance. Another city, actually village, arises on the old site, and this is called Sikar. Located near Shechem, and perhaps even in the midst of the ruins. So in other words, here's a another picture of Shechem and it could very well be because it was a big city that the village of Sikar actually was inside these walls okay they haven't discovered and excavated all of Shechem but it is highly likely that Sikar is in Shechem it was a New Testament city and Jacob's well the tradition was supposedly located at Sikar okay this is interesting. There it is, Sikar and Shechem. And then one day, who shows up? And he had to pass through Samaria and see who he is. So he came to a city in Samaria called Sikar. Jesus, the promise through Abraham, shows up at Shechem. On the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and in the New Testament, you're reading about a tradition. And Jacob's well was there. That's not true. Well, you're going to hang on to this. You're going to have a tough time with this. In the New Testament's day, there was no Jacob's well that they can prove ex exclusively that Jacob did it. We have no proof of that. None. It's not in the Old Testament at all. But all of a sudden, here's the first time you read it. That's a tradition. I want, God is just, you guys want every word of the Bible to be, that's true, Jacob's well, therefore God said it, so therefore Jacob's well was there and Jacob did it. No, he didn't. Jacob is, God's using culture. Understand that. Every, every Jew in Jesus' day understood Jacob's well. Okay? It was tradition. No problem. Do you understand that Paul, Paul quotes pagan poems? Did you know that? Six times in his letters. That's the word of God. Six pagan poems. Isn't that interesting? You, you have to get a different appreciation for the word of God. God uses culture. He uses customs. He inspires Paul to do this, so he gets a message to you. God didn't write the Bible. What did he do? He had these men inspired to write the word. Are you with me? We're dealing with the inspired word of God. God did not write it. God did not come to Moses and say, hey, Moses, sit down. I want you to, I'm going to dictate these five books to you. In the beginning, God, Moses wrote that. Inspired by God. Are you with me? But it's the word of God. But he didn't write it. He inspired it. So this is a very, this is a challenge to Christians. It's not a challenge to me anymore. I just rejoice in this. I rejoice in it. You know why? Because this does connect this story, this connects this story to Jacob. That's what God is trying to say to you. Forget it's tradition. Forget it's probably not even true. What's God trying to do through John? He's trying to show you something at Shechem. We can't get all hung up on some of our Christian traditions, especially in light of what God's trying to do here. Yes, sir. Could not the well represent the people? 
It possibly could. The Bible doesn't say that. It could be. Yeah, the Bible doesn't say that, but it could very well be the people. It's a possibility. Here she comes. The Samaritan woman. Do you remember what you heard about Samaritans the other day? <laughs> Jesus is in Samaria. Are you kidding? The Jews hated the Samaritans more than they hated the Romans. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hated the Samaritans more than they hated Jesus. And he's going to talk to this woman. Are you kidding? Do you understand why the disciples were, well, he's talking to this woman. On top of that, she's a Samaritan. Ay, 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 ay. This, I mean, his 11, his 12, they went to get him lunch. Okay, by the time they come back, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. What's he going to do? Call lightning down and, and completely destroy her? She's a Samaritan, you know. So you read that the other, this is amazing stuff. What went through their mind, the 12? What went through their mind after this event when Jesus does the parable of the Good Samaritan? Can you just see Matthew sitting there hitting John? Do you remember the Samaritan woman? Yeah. She's our neighbor. Oh my gosh. Oh, let's talk to Jesus about this over coffee tonight. Can you, I mean, you got to think about this. These guys are just like, they, they want to kill this woman. I mean, they didn't want to kill her, but they, they didn't like her. Look at this. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So there they are. Having that discussion, I know the Messiah is coming, she says. He was called Christ, okay? That means in Hebrew, Mashiach, okay? In Hebrew, when that one comes, he will declare that all things, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. When did Jesus ever say he's the Messiah? He just did it. And who did he say it to? Did he say it to a Jew? No. The enemies of the Jews. That is... My head spins. God loves his people. He says it to a Samaritan, a half-breed. This is amazing stuff. And it's at Shechem. God's promise. One God, one Lord. Look at this. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. Abraham, Shechem. Jacob, Shechem. Joshua, Shechem. Jesus, Sikar. We missed the point. We didn't know Sikar is Shechem. What is God trying to say to you? Jacob's well. Where do you read that in the Bible? The only other place you'll read about it in the Bible is the story of Jacob. God's trying to make this connection. One book. Where is Jesus in the Old Testament? At Shechem. And we don't know the history. We don't know that. This is amazing. I want to dance the first time I saw this. This is just cool. And I just love sharing this with you. It's just so awesome. The Bible becomes so exciting to me to realize Jesus is in the Torah. Jesus is in the Old Testament. Now we've got to find him. We're not Jewish. Ay, ay, ay. I'm not done yet. Did you have a question you were going to? No, okay. Just waving your hand. Okay. Oh, got it. Abraham comes here as one man with his wife Sarah. Jacob is next. Right with the kids and the family, Rachel and Leah. Joshua is next. He comes with the entire nation, right? Probably millions or thousands for sure. The promises of God are appearing right before our eyes. Abraham is people and a place. Jesus comes to Shechem. The promises of God are complete at one position. God is giving you a picture geographically. The purpose of God's covenant is made manifest at Shechem. Jesus said, at Shechem, I am he, the one who speaks to you. I am the promise of Abraham. I am the one that was promised through Abraham that all the nations will be blessed because of me and through me. Wow. Abraham, Jacob, all of Israel, and now Jesus to the world, and he announces this at Shechem to a non-Jew. 
loves us. Yay! Thank goodness. This is a bigger story than Israel, but he comes out of Israel. It's just huge. Shechem. One little side note is, I wonder what the word Shechem means. We've got God's promise, one God and one Lord, all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Shechem, in Hebrew, means back or shoulder. It's a city in Manasseh, 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 located in the valley between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, 35 more, 34 miles north of Jerusalem, and seven miles uh, now in proper seven miles from something. Okay, but it's interesting is this Shechem, the shoulders of Abraham, who got the promise. Abraham, he carried the promise on his shoulders. Shechem. This, God is really trying to give you the story now. Abraham, carrying to shoulders, gives it to his son and then his grandson. Jacob carries it. The family grows, and on them are the shoulders of the promise. From that, it goes to all of Israel. Joshua comes in. They establish the, the kingdom of Israel later on. On their shoulders is the promise, and Jesus is on their shoulders, standing upon all of them that had come before and through them. It? It's just so cool. I can see Jesus standing on, the, on their shoulders. Okay? How you doing, Joshua? Are you okay? Abraham, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I'm 172 pounds. I don't know how heavy Jesus was. But the thing is, is that whole line, all standing on their shoulders. So again, I just love this. I, I, had, I wanted to show this during the service, but again, what we come up to again is one, one book, one God, one Lord, one salvation plan. The salvation plan begins in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, we would even say that it's when God talks to the snake, right? And says, one is coming. He's going to be the seed of the woman. And he basically says, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. It begins there. That goes all the way. How can we dismiss the Old Testament? You know, that's the only Bible they had up until 150 A.D. The church started with the Old Testament. And they would open up the Old Testament and they would just... I remember, remember the two guys on the Emmaus Road? Okay? And Jesus opens up the scriptures to them. You can read it. And he goes through the books of Moses, the Torah, and the prophets, and he shows them himself. Later on, one of them, I can't remember his name, I think it's Cleophas or something, but anyway, one of them says, weren't our hearts burning because he had opened up the scriptures so we can see him? Wouldn't you like to get a CD of that discussion? Jesus teaching the Old Testament to show them himself to the two guys? Because that's all they had. And they were massacred in some cases by Roman emperors, and all they had was the Old Testament. We're missing the point. And God wants you reconnected to the reality and the foundation of our faith. What's the first five books of the, of the Bible that he gave to us? The Torah, the five books of Moses, and the promise of uh, Messiah, right there in Genesis. Oh, and by the way, I guess you do this. What did God create on day one? Nope. Oh, no, he didn't. God created the heavens and the earth, but what did he create on day one? Light. When did he create the sun and the moon? Day four. The rabbis for thousands of years have struggled. Not you. Okay. You guys say, well, it's a big bang theory. <laughs> yeah, it's a big bang and the energy of light and you treat the book, we, tr we treat the book like it's a science book. It's not a science book, it's God's word. It's instruction to us. 
rabbis for thousands of years struggled with, what's this light? He creates the sun and the moon and the stars on day four. What's this light on day one? One rabbi says, I've got an idea. What's your idea? I think it's the light of Messiah. Now remember, Jews do not believe that Jesus is Messiah, right? So please, the, the Messiah, they believe in Messiah. Ah, that's interesting. So the light of Messiah comes in and begins to infiltrate all of the universe. Yeah. Wow, that's good. So you have some rabbis over the last 2,000 years who are writing in Jewish literature that they think the light on day one was the light of Messiah. What does John write about Jesus in John chapter 1? Jesus is the light of the world and he was with God the Father when he created it at the beginning. John is saying, okay, what? Day one, the light of the world is the light of Messiah. Because John then writes the book of Revelation and he says, and this is really cool, what I just said, the light of the world the light is created on day one. There was no sun or moon. The light of the, the, listen, the light of the world was created on day one, no sun or moon. The light of the world was created on day one, there was no sun and moon. In the book of Revelation, chapter two, it says in the New Jerusalem, okay? The light of Messiah will shine in the New Jerusalem and there will be no need of the sun or the moon. Genesis chapter one, Revelation 22, one book. Wow. What's God trying to tell you? I sometimes hug this book. I want so much more of life through him. I want to know him more. Just like Shechem. One book, one gospel. Oh, amazing stuff. I'm sorry, I get so excited. <sighs> That's why he didn't get much sleep when we were in the Middle East. I'd wake up at three in the morning screaming, yes, wow. Time to go to the bathroom, John. So again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill in some more information uh, on your map. We went from the Negev to the central area, and from the central area, now we're gonna take a look at the Jezreel. And let me take a look at what I did for you guys. These maps are in my book, and I can't remember what I did for you guys. And can I see your map for the Jezreel? Does anybody have it? Sir, let me just take a look at it real quick. Okay. Got it. You guys have lines, I have dots. I've got a yellow dot, you have a yellow line, then I have a red dot, you have a red line, then I have a blue dot, you have a blue line. You go around the corner, right? So watch the screen. Watch the screen for the Jezreel Valley, watch this. That's what I want you to do. It's an arrowhead. Imagine. Imagine what you gave me last night. What's the first thing that came to my mind for this? This. So this is what I want you to do. It's an arrowhead. This is really cool because when you fly into Israel, depending on what direction you fly in, if you fly in the Jezreel Valley, you can look down, you can see the arrowhead. It's really awesome to actually see that from, you know, about 20,000 feet up. That's the Jezreel Valley. Did you guys fill it in already? You got it? Okay. That's the Jezreel. Here's the Jezreel Valley. It's Iowa. And South Dakota, okay? It's flat. This is farmland. This is the breadbasket of Israel. In the back, you can see Mount Tabor. Let me show you. Let me go back to the map here. Right here in this corner of the arrowhead, right in here, that's where Mount Tabor is. So we're here at the top looking across the Jezreel Valley to Mount Tabor. There it is. So we're basically at Megiddo, and we're looking at Mount Tabor. 
and you can see all the flatland wheat. I mean, they're growing wheat here, pomegranates, everything. It is just amazing, okay? Let's see what else I have up here. Here's Megiddo. That's where I had that other picture taken. Right up here, I took that picture at Tel Megiddo. You, you call it Armageddon, okay? And I was looking from this direction, this way, down to Mount Tabor. So Megiddo is in the Jezreel Valley. Here's Megiddo. This is a picture of what the city would have looked like uh, in those days. And I was standing here, taking that picture, looking this way to Mount Tabor. There it is. There's the Jezreel Valley. Look at this. Can, can you see? You can almost see the arrowhead. Can't you see that? Okay. Let me put it back in there again. And right up here is Megiddo. However, I just want to do something quick to you because of geography. This is the possible location of a town called Ofra. Okay, I got the question mark up there because archaeologists are saying, uh, could be, based upon some of the things that they found. But archaeology, you know, many times they find some things and they may have still questions. So they think this is a possible site for the village called Ofra. I'm standing, taking a picture. Actually, I'm not taking the picture. This is from, um, this is a public domain picture. This is the area of Ofra. So if you were at Ofra or that site, this is where you would be looking down into the Jezreel. Now, before I do that, what I want to mention is this. Where do people grow wheat? Do they grow it in the mountains or do they grow it on a flat piece of land? flat piece of land. It doesn't grow very well in the mountains, okay? So you would agree that the wheat is grown down in that valley, right? And the corn and all that type of stuff. You need it on a big plot of land. Not up in this mountain. I mean, look, you look at the mountain, you can see lower, like, there's, no, there's no good land. Oh, great for grapes? Oh, wow. Where do you grow grapes in Israel? In the mountains. Okay, you grow them on the flat area too, but the mountains were the best for that. Okay, look at this. Judges 6, 11 through 16. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Johash, the uh, Abizrite, and his son Gideon. Oh, Gideon is in Ophrah, and he's beating wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. Stop. He's beating and threshing the wheat in a wine press to save it from the Midianites. Now read the story from a geographical position. Where are the Midianites? They're in the Jezreel. Why are they there? Because the Midianites are just savages. They came in to get the wheat. They came in to get the corn. They're raiders. They come from uh, Transjordan, especially uh, south of the Dead Sea. They come in there and they're, they're just going to rape the land. That's the Midianites. And so if you're a Hebrew and you're growing, can you imagine the wheat plot that they had up in the mountains? Probably 10 feet by 10 feet. I mean, they didn't have much. They couldn't go down there. They'd be slaughtered, right? So he's threshing the wheat in a wine press. Why in a wine press? Because that's what they had in the mountains. Because they're growing wine. They're growing vines there. If you know the geography, Ophra is it? Does Gideon live in Ophra? Yeah. No. Could be. All right. I just say no to all of a sudden get the reaction from Gordon. I love doing that to him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you, sir. <laughs> but anyway, Ophrah could be the place they escaped to. They could have lived down in the Jezreel. It could have been a farmer down there, and they escaped because of the Midianites. So it's a, it's a yes or no. Okay. Right now, he's living in Ophrah. <laughs> That's quite definite. You know, but it's interesting to actually start asking the questions, something like that. Did he actually live there? So, again, this is the possibility of being up on top of the mountain. 
He's beating out wheat in a wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. What's going on? This makes no sense. Geography, geography, geography. It's not our land. Vines are grown on the Carmel Range, vineyards. Wheat is grown in the valley below. Midianites controlled the Jezreel, as I mentioned to you. We read and study the Midianites to find out they were raiders. Gideon and his family have to eat, and they grow wheat up in the mountains. They can't grow it down there because they'll be, they'll be wiped out. But there's no flat place to thresh the wheat in the threshing floors. So what do they do? There's a threshing floor. This is a real threshing floor. And I think actually this one is in Italy. Okay, this is a threshing floor that's actually in Italy. The, the ones in Israel were the same. Okay, so you put your wheat down here. Some of them were bigger. And all they had was a small flat place of the wine press. This is a wine press. Lots of, and then you have, obviously, as you're doing the grapes, this area was slanted, so the grape juice would flow into the center here. And then you have this drain in here, and then it starts draining into jars. I won't go on through the whole process of making wine, but this is a wine press. They're fairly small, okay? And they're not built for threshing wheat. So it's interesting that when you take that story... And you start studying the history, but especially the geography, it really makes a lot of sense. Ophrah is up in the mountains. That's where they grow the vines, and the Midianites are down because they have captured all of the Jezreel Valley. And the Midianites, yes. Where did they come from? The Midianites, um, they think they had an area that they lived in. You, they had no country, okay? It's like the Bedouins today. The Bedouins are Muslim Arabs, okay, but they're not from Arabia, okay, they're Arabs. If you live in Saudi Arabia, that doesn't mean that you're a, you could be an Arab and live in Syria. You can be an Arab and you can live in Syria, an Arab, all right? An Arab doesn't mean you live in Saudi Arabia. An Arab is a, a, a Turp type of person, okay? Bedouins are Arabs, but they don't live in Saudi Arabia. Bedouins declare they have no country, so they're all over the place. Uh, in Israel, they gave the Bedouins, the Bez Bedouin Arabs, a uh, full right to run their own civic uh, affairs uh, right there in Israel. They didn't have to obey the laws of Israel. Okay. Well, they couldn't murder anybody. <laughs> That's why we want to come and get you. Um, so, I mean, there were certain laws, obviously, but they said, if you want to handle a murder on your own, that's totally up to you. Okay, one of the things that they used to do, this is, this is true, okay, and it would happen in Israel. It would happen in the Sinai. Um, if a young man was going to get married and the father and his son went to the girl's family and you know, they were going to arrange the marriage and everything, if they found out okay, that the girl had sex before marriage, they'd kill her. And the father. If they found out the boy was um, sowing his wild oats before marriage, they'd kill him. And the dad. The dad has responsibility for making son is pure in Allah's eyes. They did that. I don't think they do it anymore, but that was, the, that, that was severe. I actually talked to a guide who was a Bedouin in Jordan when Robin and I were there on our, on our own. And in Jordan, I asked him about this. He said, yeah. He said, in Jordan, that's exactly what we do. We hands off on the Bedouins. You go to Sinai, we're in the Sinai Peninsula, and we stopped at what they call Rephidim. Well, I don't know if it was Rephidim or not, but it was kind of a cool place to stop, and the tradition says it is. Well, we stopped there. It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and my son Tim was with me. So he got out of the car. We're going to rest. We've been driving on the Sinai Peninsula for hours, and it was really oh, a long trip. So he got out. He's wandering around, and we had our, our guide who had an Uzi machine gun, and we had our driver who had a 45 okay glock and we had a guard with us who had another uzi machine gun under his because we had to be protected from crazy egyptians who hated uh white people from the united states i'm serious so i got out and so the guard looks at me he's a very nice man very nice man so he looks at me and he says uh Reverend Ferret. i said yeah what is son tim what is son tim my son's name tim I'm like, i don't know he says get him get him now the better winner here they think this is their land. They will kill him. I said, what? So Tim, he's running through the 
pine groves and stuff like that. This is not the first time my Robin, her, my wife heard this story. The first time she's, what? He's on top of the hill. He climbs up. What? I mean, he's about 100, 150 feet up. Okay. Hey, Dad, look at me, man. I'm a Hebrew fighter. And this guard, get him down. What a perfect target. Okay. Because the Bedouin were allowed to kill anybody that kind of went into their territory. So the answer to the question, this could be similar. There was a Midianite area. Um, and then we have the strange connection between Midian and Moab. First of all, you're talking about the Moabites, and they go to the Midianite king. Then the Midianite girls did this, but God says, go. Were they connected somehow? You know, it's very fascinating. But the Midians seemed to have a territory, and the territory wasn't, didn't have any real boundaries that we know of. Fascinating thing is, study. I hope. Okay. I want to give the Sicari men, right? The zealots, they live in that area. I'll show you that in just a second. And then you have this whole region up here on the Golan Heights, through here and down south, and over here called the Decapolis. Pagan area, totally pagan. There were ten cities. Ten cities the Greeks established. Finally, the Romans uh, developed a, 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 a province, and the province was called Decapolis. Ten cities. Ten pagan cities, okay? Jews never went there, unless they were Herodians. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at the city of Tiberias. So that's your first red mark and your first box. The city of Tiberias. 
Tiberius was built by Herod's son, Herod Antipas, to honor Tiberius, who was the emperor at that time. It was built on a cemetery, so no religious Jews went there. Because they kept him clean. Because if they walk in the city, they would be automatically unclean for a week. Because it was built on the cemetery. Why did they build there now? Huh? You got a lot of Orthodox Jews. That's fair. I, I, that, that's a question I wanted to ask a guy, okay? And some of the Jewish people, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. But religious Jews live there now. So I don't know if there's a, a, a statute of limitations on dead bodies. So. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not sure. So. There is the uh, theater that actually Herod uh, Antipas actually built. It's in Tiberias. It's quite amazing to actually visit this place. Uh, it was founded in 20 AD by Antipas. Uh, it's the capital of his realm. And again, here's another picture. Oh, it's a great resort. Oh, man, swimming pools, great hotels, great food. Oh, man, what a city to visit. It's really nice. Um, City's built on a spa, and there's a bunch of mineral hot springs there. The religious Jews refused to go there because, like I said, it was it was basically built on a cemetery, built on a cemetery, so they wouldn't go there. It was populated by secular Jews known as Herodians. Okay, secular Jews. They sided first with Herod, and then also his son Antipas. Now he brought in non-Jews to further populate the new capital. Nobody wanted to live there. Well, the Jews said, "We're not going." Okay, you got a couple of pagan Jews that came there. So he had to get a lot of other people to come. The prestige of Tiberius was so great that the Sea of Tiberius then became the Sea of Tiberius. I think in Jesus' day it wasn't called the Sea of Galilee. I think in Jesus' day it was called the Sea of Tiberius. That, that's, I gotta I have to check the dates and so on. There was about three different names for uh, the body of water. The Bible does not say that Jesus, Jesus ever visited the city. Okay, it doesn't say. He may have, I, I doubt it. This is the gate to the city on the southern area. You can see the two round towers, one to your right, to the left. But this is the major Roman gate into the actual city, and that's Tiberius. And here's one of my favorite places on the face of the earth, Magdala. Oh, gosh, I love this place. It's outside of Tiberius, and at Magdala, uh, let's see, uh, what was the year? I can't remember exactly. Uh, but they found the synagogue in Magdala. You remember Matthew 4 when it says this? Jesus went out from the Galilee teaching in the gospel, and he taught in their synagogue. It's 99% likely he was in the synagogue that they found. It is so cool. You are walking on stones that Jesus walked on. God! I mean, I, I just, my hair stands up in the back. I mean, whatever hair I got left back over here. But the thing is, is that I'm serious. I get goosebumps to realize I'm walking. It's like going to Shechem. There is a mikvah over there because they would always do a ritual immersion. You would call it baptism. Not for repentance, it was just to make sure that they were richly clean to come in here and hear God's word. This is the school here where the kids would learn. Magdala is from there. Her name is not Mary Magdalene. Sorry. Well, the Bible says Mary Magdalene. Well, that's in English from the Greek. Her name is Miriam. Me Magdala. Say Miriam. Me. Me. Magdala. Mary. From Magdala. That's her. We don't know what her last name is. It should have been. If we knew her father's name, so let's make believe Miriam, her father's name was Tom. Okay? So her name would have been Miriam, Mi, uh, Miriam Bat Tomas. Miriam Bat Tomas. In other words, Miriam, the daughter of him. So her name's not Mary Magdalene. Miriam of Magdala, that's what it likely is. Jesus knew her. It's likely that he visited the synagogue there 99% for sure. I mean, you want to talk about uh, uh, the chances of that happening. The remains of the synagogue were found. It was now being made accessible to tourists. Uh, you've got to go there. Boy, if you ever get to Israel, you have got to go there. Oh, wow. And then 
Make sure after you're done, you go to the Magdala restaurant right next door. <gasps> Tilapia fish like you wouldn't believe. It is. St. Peter's fish? Nice restaurant, great, and the french fries that they ah, the best. Oh, it's just awesome. So it's right next door, okay? Yeah. So go to the synagogue and say, ah, oh, Jesus was here. Ah, oh, fish. Okay? <laughs> Matthew 4, 23, Jesus was going from the Galilee teaching the Great work there. What's that? No. <laughs> so, like I said, it's a very likely uh, situation that Jesus actually was here. This is, they've, uh, this is uh, far different now. It's now under a pavilion. Uh, it's a big Catholic site. All right, Catholic archaeologists actually discovered it. And it's now a Catholic site, but they're working with the Israeli archaeological authority. Uh, for the first time, I think, where the Catholic archaeologists and Israel are working together to make sure this site is preserved archaeologically. All right, though they have some Catholic stuff there, Catholic retreat center and a nice church there, but they wanted to build a church not on the city. In other words, there's no ruins underneath. So I don't know what all the science that they did to make sure that that happened. Right? So that's my doubt. Then we're going to deal with three cities: Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida, and then we're going to take a break. So in Hebrew, it's Kafir Nahum. Say Kafir Nahum. Chorazin. Bet Seda. Bet. Bet Seda. Okay. Bet Seda means the house of fish. Okay. Chorazin, I can't remember what that means. Kafir Nahum means the hometown of Nahum the prophet. So Nahum the prophet was from that town. Okay, Kafir, town, Nahal, of, the, of Nahal. These are the cities of the triangle. You can see them here. Here's Capernaum on the lower part of the triangle. Chorazin is three miles into the interior, and Bethsaida is right on the Jordan River. And there's a debate today. They think you found another site that's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that probably is also a likely candidate for Bethsaida. Though I think the older one is actually it. Now, these are the cities of the triangle, and you remember Jesus saying, oh, Chorazin, if you only knew, you know, what came, these three cities are going to be cursed. Remember that? Okay, he talks about these three cities. Jesus spent, if you read the Bible and understand rabbis, now, I'm not going there, that's a different course. If you understand rabbis, rabbis uh, are in a certain working area, and most of the rabbis, good rabbis, from in Judaism came from this area. Great debates of Torah were debated in this area, not Jerusalem. The great theologians of Judaism came from this area. So where does Jesus hang out? Where God and the law is debated every day. And Jesus is the greatest rabbi of them all. Wow. Right in the midst of all the great rabbis debating God's law, creating the Torah. When is Messiah coming? Who is? Wow. And he's there at the current moment. That's just amazing. So he's in that area, and it's, it's suggested that 75% of his time on earth was spent right there. He was in Jerusalem very little. Three times a year for sure, right, for the three feasts. For sure. So quite definitely. Now what we're going to do is stop and take a 10-minute break. I'll see you back here at 5 after 2.